Hello all, and welcome to the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Dorcas Davis, and I'll be your host for this session. You, Me, We, Building Community Partnerships. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Please feel free to ask questions or make comments in the chat or interact with other attendees and the speaker within the Hoover app for this presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Annalee Mills and Joanne Jones. Thanks for being with us. Welcome to our webinar, You, Me, We, Building Community Partnerships. I am Annalee Mills, Youth Services Librarian at the Ashland Public Library in Ashland, Virginia. And I'm Joanne Jones, Adult Services Specialist at the Ashland Library as well. Anna Lee and I have worked together for about two years, starting during COVID, when not a lot was really happening anywhere. As things have opened up and people have become more comfortable getting out there, we have been really intentional about our outreach and offering programming that will bring people back into the library. Getting into the realm of community partnerships was something that just seemed natural to us, and we have gradually increased the number of community partnerships that we have worked on, both separately and together. Yeah, we found that it's really helpful not to get stuck in a silo, but to be able to work with our counterpart in these types of partnerships because we spark off of each other and our programming is richer for that. Oh yes, we are certainly dangerous when we get to sparking. But seriously, having someone within your organization that you can work with or at least bounce ideas off of really does get the creative juices flowing. So what we're going to cover in this webinar is what we think that a partnership is and what ours have looked like, why bother with any of this at all, how to go about creating these partnerships, some common problems that we have encountered and that you may encounter and how to overcome them. And we'll finish by walking through our process with a real partnership idea that we have for this summer's reading program. First, let's define what we're talking about when we say community partnership. As we're defining it, Partnership is sharing an activity that benefits both parties. This can look like whatever you want it to. The important thing to note is that it isn't all about the library. We're not sucking all the goodness to ourselves and we aren't selflessly sending everything out into the community. The most successful partnerships are the ones where everyone feels like they got the best part of the deal. We want to start by giving you an idea of some of the things that we've done in Ashland. Maybe some of them will resonate with you and maybe they won't, but we're hoping that you'll find something interesting. So Ashland is a smallish town about 20 minutes north of Richmond, Virginia, and we have a very Mayberry-ish feel. Our library literally sits next to the train tracks that run through the town. To cross the street, you have to walk across the train tracks. Because trains are so central to the identity of our community, about 20 years ago, the library decided to have a celebration around trains and train day was born. It literally started with just a small scale Saturday morning children's programming event about trains. And now the event has gotten so big it's been taken over by our downtown Ashland Association. It's a day long event held the last Saturday in April and attended by more than 10,000 people. And it all started because someone at the library had an idea and started trying to get other people in town on board. Now, businesses, nonprofits, churches, and a host of other entities all participate in Ashland's Train Day. And it involves model train shows, railroad history talks, live music, shopping, and other festival type events. The library is still involved. We host three speakers or activities that day and have train themed displays and take and makes. We just aren't in charge of it. So I started at the library during 2020 and began putting together some partnerships, but they didn't really take off until COVID restrictions eased and Joanne started as our adult services specialist. She lives in Ashland and she knows everyone. So I couldn't do story times in the library because of the restrictions and little kids adore the trains and run right to them when they pass, making outside the library dangerous. No squishy children, we didn't want that. So I contacted the town and they let us use a local park pavilion to have outdoor story times, which were very popular. 
we met with Amy Hook from Ashland Parks and Rec, who was inspired to contact us because of our story times at the park. And that meeting led to a story walk in the local park where I had done outdoor story times. The library supplied the book and they supplied the stands. That was in November, but we're planning future story walks for spring and summer as well. We also set up a table in the library for children to color pumpkins, which Emmy then laminated and put all around the parks for a scavenger hunt for Halloween. And we're working on another collaboration with them as well. We came up with the idea of hosting a Where's Waldo scavenger hunt in the town parks. We proposed three different scenarios. First, we could have people pick up search sheets at the library to have them try to find Waldo pictures hidden at the parks, one in each park in town. Or we could have folks pick up the search sheets that would involve a search all over town, starting at the library, then extending to the parks in various businesses around town, such as the toy store, the local grocery, or the cookie shop. Or we could do an event where we gather people at the library, then send them out with a map of the parks to try and find a real life Waldo hanging out in one of the parks. I think this might be super appealing to college kids and young adults. So now we have to wait and see if the town's parks and rec department is interested in doing one of these scenarios, or if they are going to come back with an idea that we haven't even thought of yet. But it's not just us reaching out. The local elementary school contacted us about having someone from the library go to mobile home parks through the summer to sign folks up for summer reading, while the schools worked at connecting with families and giving kids fun things to do to keep their skills up. I discovered that most of these families are Spanish speaking and realized that I never saw any of them in the library. How hard would it be to help your kid do their math homework if you can't speak the language the math is written in? These people needed resources in the library, and Joanne and I collaborated with the schools to create Spanish Parents Night at the library. The schools thought that it would be a fabulous idea to get their Spanish-speaking families more comfortable using the library and agreed that they could reach out to the parents, provide a teacher who would serve as an interpreter, and design a craft activity to keep the kids busy while Anna Lee and I met with the parents. The biggest challenge was figuring out a time for the program because we wanted to do it in the evening but didn't want to interfere with dinner because we thought that that may keep some people from coming. We had the idea to approach the owner of a meeting space within walking distance of the library to see if they would be willing to host families during the dinner hour. They agreed to provide the space and a local church stepped up to provide pizza and voila, we had the whole evening covered. As far as the program for parents, we didn't want to overwhelm them by discussing all the library's many resources, so we decided to just focus on a few key resources. After we explained how to sign up for library cards, we focused on teaching how to access resources that we thought would be of the most use to them, like free online tutoring, language learning, and Spanish language magazines. This was so well received that we ended up having to do two separate sessions to accommodate everyone. And the schools have asked us to do another one in May that will focus on summer reading and how to use the catalog. That was a pretty big collaboration, but we also do small things. The Ashland Theater is a historic theater and performing arts venue in downtown Ashland and is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. The Ashland Theater was hosting a mini holiday cozy con in December, featuring several popular cozy mystery writers. So we decided to set up a display featuring cozy mystery books and made copies of some of the recipes from the books that people could take with them. We also put QR codes on the recipes, which directed patrons to additional cozy mystery books and other library resources. We are also within walking distance of the Red Vein Escape Room. They do escape rooms and haunted history talks, and we had the idea of collaborating with them to do something around Edgar Allan Poe, as Poe himself lived in Richmond, and his lost love, Sarah Elmira Royster, at one time lived in Ashland. So in February, we invited the Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Richmond to do a program called What's in Poe's Trunk, and when participants finished that, they were given coupons to go through a Poe-themed escape room at Red Bain. We thought that this was a great way to introduce younger patrons to Edgar Allan Poe in a fun and creative way involving the library, 
the museum and an escape room. Probably our biggest collaboration so far was a week long community wide event in February, which we called celebrating space in the center of the universe. Ashland affectionately refers to itself as the center of the universe, so that is where that reference came from. We wanted to do outreach and programming that would benefit the entire community, so we tapped into our resources in our own backyard, Randolph-Macon College, the town of Ashland, and the Ashland Theater. Randolph-Macon is a small liberal arts college that is within walking distance of the library, and they have an observatory which houses the largest telescope between Washington, D.C. and the Blue Ridge Mountains. So we reached out to the, all of these entities to plan seven events over the course of six days involving a variety of space-related topics to interest people of all ages. We had two programs at the library that week featuring physics professors from Randolph-Macon who talked about the history of the universe and comets and impactors. One night, Randolph-Macon College hosted an open house at their observatory that was open to the public. And we also had a virtual chat with a PhD graduate student about her research on stars. We also reached out to the town's parks and recs department to host a star viewing party at one of the town's parks. The library hosted a stomp rocket event for grades two through eight. And finally, the Ashland Theater hosted a free showing of the movie Hidden Figures on February 11th, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. We think that this was a great event because it allowed us to tap into constituencies that may or may not have even known about or ever been in the library. College students, people who just come into town to go to a park or a movie, and vice versa. There may be people who use the library but have never been in Randolph-Macon's observatory. So in our view, it benefited all of the partners. And we're already thinking about what we're going to celebrate in the center of the universe next year. So this is just a sample of the entities that we've partnered with so far. Schools, local businesses, local governments, and nonprofits, and a really wide variety of events. But why venture outside the library? After all, we can get plenty of speakers and programs without the headache of partnering with anyone for an event. Why bother? Our goal is to make the library visibly relevant to our community by combining programming and outreach. I'm sure we're all aware that libraries are often under attack. Funding is always an issue, and we're always having to remind people what a valuable resource the library truly is. Successful collaborations get attention for the library. They underscore the vital place the library has in the community, and they can help to build an active and vocal support base. But that's not all they do. These collaborations can reach new audiences. Those people I was seeing in the mobile home parks never saw them in the library. Now I do. I wouldn't have been able to reach them if the school hadn't been involved in creating Spanish Parents Night. They were able to get people into the library that I couldn't. And sometimes your patrons get stuck in ruts. They only come in and do the same things over and over. Students from the college only saw us as a place to study. With the college partnership, we were able to snag students' attention for programs, not just study tables. You also have the opportunity to double your marketing. Our library doesn't have a huge marquee on the main drag through town, but the Ashland Theater does. When we partner with them, we get to advertise an event to everyone who drives by. Every avenue that your partner uses to advertise their events becomes your avenue and vice versa, so everyone wins. In the Spanish Parents Night, we got to demonstrate the value of databases that none of the families were using. If people don't know about our resources, they can't use them. It's not often that you hear people gasp when they hear about a database, but these folks did. In our partnerships, we also gain access to subject matter experts, like the folks at the Poe Museum and the professors at the college. So, how do you get started? Especially if you think that you don't know anyone. How do you go about finding these community partners? There are several ways. For better or worse, I am still a person who gets a physical copy of our local newspaper delivered daily. And that is a great resource for local events and human interest stories. 
that's where he found out the name of an artist who painted holiday scenes in businesses around town and how he found out that our Parks and Rec Department had hired a new coordinator. Even if you don't get a physical newspaper, there are certainly online newspapers or newsletters that contain the same types of information. I have signed up to receive email announcements from both our town and county governments and the Downtown Ashland Association, and that is a great way to stay in the know. You can also drive down the street. Just on my way to work, I pass a local museum, the local rescue squad, the town government offices, and many small locally owned businesses. We've partnered with all of these organizations for programming in the last year. Open the mail. I know that everyone gets a lot of things in the mail and a lot of it's junk, but oftentimes there are publications advertising new organizations or new businesses that may be good partners. And open your phone. I am not a huge social media person, but having access to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all the other social media is a great way to see what's out there. Finally, talk to people. Our patrons come from a very diverse community, and in talking to them and getting to know them, we're able to tap into resources that are already walking through our doors. One example of this is we have a patron who was new to town and used to lead ghost tours in another city. So he was willing to do a presentation around Halloween called Scary Tales in the Old Dominion, based on the books by L.B. Taylor. Because of this program, the library got to be included as a stop in the downtown Ashland Halloween celebration and was included in its promotion of this event. So what should I look for? You have all of these avenues for acquiring information, publications, newsletters, etc. What exactly are you looking for? New kids on the block. Are there new organizations or individuals that you can introduce to library patrons? And as important, are there new organizations or individuals who can be introduced to the library? As we've said, our goal is to make our library visibly relevant to our community by combining programming and outreach. We have been surprised by the number of people who do not have a full appreciation of all of the library's many resources. And we believe that educating people and introducing people outside the library to our resources is just as important as providing additional programming to our existing patrons. For instance, in a recent meeting, a member of the local PTO was indignant when she learned about all of our upcoming programs because she didn't know about any of them. She asked if we had a website or something that she could find these on. Insert the eye roll here. But that just goes to show how critical it is that we use other avenues to let people know what we do. So who's a new kid on the block? As an example, as we mentioned, when Ashland hired a new coordinator for its Parks and Rec Department, we met with her to see how we could collaborate to get more library patrons into the parks and more town residents who use its parks to get into the library. And that's how we ended up with the story walk and the pumpkin activity. And when she heard about the nature backpacks that we offer, she was thrilled and wanted to promote them to park users. What looks like fun? Are there local events or festivals that lots of people will be attending that the library can be a part of? We already talked about train day, but there are a lot of other things going on in our community like Halloween events. We have a downtown lighting event around the holidays. And in the summer, we have the Ashland Strawberry Fair and the Hanover Tomato Festival. So who's hot, who's not? What's going on in your community that you can be a part of? When we met with folks from the Ashland Theater, they mentioned that the theater was hosting the Cozy Mystery Day. And so prior to that event, we set up that display we talked about earlier. Is there a business that everyone's talking about? We have a new cookie store that we're inviting in to do cookie decorating with our teens. Who knows their way around the block? Are there established entities or organizations with existing groups of supporters that you can tap into? The Hanover County Black Heritage Society is an organization in Hanover County that has a vibrant membership, but only a small space. So we've partnered with them to host monthly speakers and events and to set up displays. But how do I know if they'll be a good partner? First, you obviously need to do your homework. Find out as much as you can about what the organization does and how it can complement the mission of the library before approaching them. Remember your goal 
or at least our goal when we do this, is to make the library visibly relevant in the community. You may determine at the outset that even though something may sound really cool, partnering with a particular organization or person won't work. And the sooner you figure that out, the better. Does the organization have particular assets that you're interested in, such as speakers who can provide information or education to your patrons? And what is the reach of the potential partner? Will you be tapping into a whole new market of potential library patrons and be able to reach people outside of the library to bring them in? For instance, college students in town, theater goers, people who attend the farmer's market. You also need to consider what your library is able to offer the potential partner. Know your own resources. Do you have a venue to offer the potential partner, whether it's meeting space inside the library, an outdoor space, or the ability to set up a virtual event? Do you have any other special services that your library has, like offering a program on the Entrepreneurial Learning Institute and the Gale Legal Form databases to the local Chamber of Commerce? You also need to be aware of your limitations. Do you have the budget for an activity? Is it likely that it would be approved? Is your meeting space large enough? Might your potential partner only be able to do things after the library closes? That sort of thing. So it's time to formulate a plan. What do you want to do? What's the idea? My original idea was just to have some kind of class for the Spanish speaking mothers so they could learn about the tutoring available from BrainFuse Help Now. When I spoke with the family engagement specialist, she told me that the mothers didn't have transportation during the day, but that they all had access to the internet via their phones. So we tossed around the idea of doing a Zoom class with an interpreter. I also had an idea of what days that would work for me during the week, but didn't know if moms would be able, uh, would be interested. But after meeting with the family engagement specialist, the interpreter, and the teachers in different meetings, and bringing Joanne in, because this wasn't exactly a children's program, and it wasn't completely an adult program, we determined that the final shape of the event, which turned out to be completely different than how it started out. Our timeline also had to change to meet the needs of the school and the event space. I had to completely rearrange my normal schedule to accommodate what the school and event space needed. So flexibility is key. In the program handouts, we've included a partnership worksheet. This is a great tool for putting all your ideas and information in one place. I am a very visual person, so writing things down works well for me. But I urge you, write in pencil. Finally, go for it. You've identified a potential partner and you have a draft proposal. Now what? How do you approach them? In my experience, face-to-face -face is usually the best way and most likely to produce the best results. Think of it as developing relationships with people first, then figuring out how you can make something great come out of it. Plus, if you approach them in person, the potential partner will know that you've made an investment of time in the proposal and it will seem more credible and more doable to them. Of course, face-to-face -face is usually not going to be the easiest option. So second best is a phone call. If you're going to make the call, know the name or at least the title or position of the person you would like to speak to. Again, it shows that you've made the investment of time to get to know the organization if you know the correct person or at least the title of that person that you should speak to. I find that also helps if you're able to tell them why you chose them to reach out to. From the outset, you're making a personal connection in the beginning of a relationship. So it may be a little bit more difficult for them to say no to you. If you do send an email, which is perfectly fine, be as personal as possible. As I mentioned before, know who you're emailing, tell them why you chose them, reference mutual connections or interests, that sort of thing. So that said, my typical approach is to email someone, outline why I'm approaching them, and suggest a phone call or meeting if they're interested in pursuing this idea. Joanne is more likely to approach someone in person, but she lives in Ashland and has a great relationship with many of the business owners and government staff. But 
don't worry if you don't have that kind of relationship. Honestly, I've been shocked by how many people want to meet in person and are willing to travel to the library. I didn't think that people had time for that, but they tell me that they're looking for excuses to get out of the office. I don't live in Ashland and don't really know many people in the community, but I've never had anyone flat out refuse me. Normally, people are very receptive to anything to do with the library, at least in our community. And the more people you work with, the more that word gets around that you're good to work with and open to doing things together. As a matter of fact, we've been absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of people who are now approaching us and wanting to partner in things. There have been times when we've had to thank people politely and say that what they're proposing, while it's great, it doesn't fit into our calendar or programming needs right now, and that we will certainly keep them in mind for the future. We don't want to shut the door to future collaborations, but we really can only do so much. And speaking of that, the month of February this year just about killed us. There were so many partnership related things going on. They were all good things, but there were so many of them. It seemed like they were all happening at once and we were both feeling pretty overwhelmed. So take a bit of hard learned advice and take it slowly and spread out your events. Partnerships are fabulous, but they can also be really hard work. The planning stages are so much fun, it's easy to go overboard, but then you get to the execution stage and you're thinking, how am I going to pull this all off? So take it slowly and spread things out. Now, let's talk about some important groups that we're a part of that may exist in your community or that you may want to form. I'm a member of the Ashland Community Partners, which is a group that was formed by a church that was interested in seeing how they could reach out and assist their community. The focus of this organization is children and consists of people from that church, the schools, the YMCA, the parent teacher organization, the arts and activity center, and private organizations that serve families. They meet once a quarter to discuss what each group is doing and we determine how we can support each other's efforts instead of duplicating what's going on. For instance, before I joined this group, the Arts and Activities Center had a showing of Encanto the same week that I was doing an interactive Encanto program. If we know what dates we're doing things, we can avoid these conflicts. We can also piggyback off of each other. Let's say the school is doing an all school read of the one and only Ivan. The library can do a display and have books about gorillas and Ivan read-alikes maybe even do a one and only Ivan program or partner with the school to bring in the author, Catherine Applegate. By forming these groups, we support each other and create a greater sense of community, which can only be good, right? The other group we're a part of is a youth committee for a local entity that is supposed to be focused on teens. Now, I'll confess to being a bit skeptical of this one and the jury is still out on it. This group also has members from the library, the schools, the YMCA, county government, and the religious community. The group is not very diverse, even though it's supposed to be representing a diverse community of interests. I'm hoping that this is just an oversight, but I believe that it is problematic. So I'm going to have to find a way to politely suggest to the folks in charge of this group that they may want to expand the diversity of the group. The reason we tell you this is that if you don't already have a group of partners in your community, think about forming one. Because who is better to put together a coalition of people to serve the community than the ones who do it daily, right? If you decide to do this, first, really take a look at your calendar. Trying to get a group like this off the ground is going to require an investment of time and energy to start with. And if you don't have the time or the energy, don't start. While having a group of partners can be an extremely valuable entity, a group that starts and then fizzles out is just going to leave a bad impression. If you have an active Friends of the Library group, they may have the time that you lack and a member might be willing to chair the group. Friends members are often very civic-minded, well-connected individuals, and they might be perfect for the job. Before you decide to approach a Friends member or take it on yourself though, Definitely decide what you want the focus of the group to be. 
Is it seniors, children, people with disabilities, young adults? The larger your community, then the narrower your focus can be. If you're in a small community, then you can consider broadening the focus. Next, ask around to see if there's a group already meeting. If there isn't, that's your cue to get it started. If there is, then see if you can join that group. So you've decided to go ahead. Brainstorm a list of stakeholders. As librarians, it shouldn't be difficult to research who is offering services to your target audience. Let's say that you decide to start a group to focus on seniors. Churches, synagogues, or mosques, especially those with aging congregations, may be interested in sending representatives. Government entities that serve seniors, your parks and rec department, adult education centers, and adult daycares may all be interested in at least seeing what you have in mind. Cast your net wide. Don't just look at agencies, look at the communities you're hoping to serve. Do you have an underserved population that you don't see in the library much? For Ashland, as we mentioned, it was our Hispanic population. We learned from the schools that the Hispanic population was growing by leaps and bounds. At the beginning of the year, they were seeing about 40 new families a month. But we weren't seeing a corresponding uptick in the library, so we knew that there was an underserved population there. By working with a Spanish interpreter and the teachers, we were able to figure out what was going on in that community because the families knew them and trusted them. Trust is a huge issue with many underserved communities. So figure out who it is that they trust and invite that person. The interpreter and a teacher representative are part of the Ashland Community Partners, but they have not yet been included in the other youth committee that Annalie mentioned. So you need to set a date for your meeting and write up what the purpose of your group is and truly write out the purpose. That purpose will not only shape the way the group runs, but it will let people know what they're letting themselves in for. Most of us are very busy and are being pulled in a number of different directions. So you are more likely to have better attendance at your meeting if you can clearly state what the purpose of the meeting is and why that particular person or entity was invited to attend. Absolutely. Then sound people out. Do you have personal relationships with these people? Then ask them what they think. If you're getting a negative or watery response from more than one person, then drop it. Life is too short to make things like that happen. But if you are getting an enthusiastic or at least not negative response, then you've got the green light. Send out email invitations and follow up with phone calls or in-person visits if you can swing that kind of time. You can also consider whether your budget will stretch towards providing a meal, allowing you to lure your attendees in with a free lunch. You could also ask that everyone bring a bag lunch and you'll provide drinks or dessert. Remember that everyone is busy and the easier you make it for people to attend, the better. If they're willing, you could also do Zoom meetings, which can be easier for people to attend, but don't work as well for the free flowing discussions that thrive with in-person meetings. Now, let me get on my soapbox here for just a minute. For goodness sake, learn how to run a meeting. Nothing will sabotage your group faster than a poorly run meeting. Philadelphia's Chestnut Hill College has a really good resource called How to Run an Effective Meeting, which I've posted in the resources. Even if you think you're an ace at running meetings, take a look at it for a refresher. Librarians are notoriously bad at running meetings. Don't be that guy, okay? If you see people sighing and slouching in their chairs, checking their watches or stabbing their eyes out, you are that guy. Get help now. Your group should decide how frequently they want to meet. We recommend quarterly. It's not often enough to feel like you're being bogged down, but it's frequent enough to feel like you're doing some good. Also, be sure to collect and then disseminate a list of the names of the people who attended um, and include their affiliations and their email addresses. It's a bummer to get a lead on an exciting collaboration idea, only to have that person need to leave the meeting early and you didn't have a chance to catch their name and you don't know how to reach them. 
So what have I gotten myself into? I need my head examined. No, you don't. Everything is not always going to go seamlessly because if it did, hey, where would be the fun in that? But seriously, we definitely have had times when we've looked at each other with the big eye roll going, what are we doing? This isn't how I thought it was going to go. So the best way to deal with problems is to plan for them and know how you will address them. What could possibly go wrong? Usually in our experience, problems can fall into one of two categories. The first we call, what the heck? This refers to a lack of understanding on someone's part about the whole how the whole thing is going to go down. Wait, the library is approaching me about doing what? You may have to spend some time educating the potential partner about your library and what its resources are. Sometimes we have to bite our tongues when dealing with people who literally don't use the library and think that all we have are books. They're like, wait, you can do what? You have that? And we have to be patient and explain all that we can do. Sometimes people are embarrassed that they don't know what we can do. And we have to assure them that they're not alone and not say what we're really thinking, which of course is, oh my gosh, how can you not know that the library has this? For instance, when we were discussing the databases that we wanted to cover for the Spanish Parents Night, we showed the teachers help now and demonstrated the live tutoring option. I thought they were gonna jump out of their seats. They kept asking us to show them things, then looked at each other and said, how did we not know this existed? Obviously, we need to spend more time in the library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even though we can do a lot of things, we do have limitations, which the partner may or may not understand. Our library is a public library, and we can't really do things outside of our normal operating hours or charge money or offer certain content, all of which are things that they may or may not know or understand. For instance, we've had some groups that we wanted to do a Comic-Con with, but they wouldn't do it unless they could sell their items, which we're not allowed to do. For them, the exposure and audience wasn't enough, and that's fine too. Some groups may feel like they aren't getting what they need from us, so we can let that potential partner go with no hard feelings. And sometimes you may not understand the potential partner's limitations either. The time it would take to do something, what their mission really is, or how much it would cost for them to do something. For instance, we didn't understand how constrained the Ashland Theater is by their movie contracts, which affected how one of our ideas could be executed. For instance, for celebrating space in the center of the universe, we asked the theater to show hidden figures. But because they were already under contract to show a first run movie, they were not allowed to charge money for showing another movie and they couldn't afford to show it for free. So one of their board members scrambled around and located a donor who took care of the cost of the movie and they were able to show hidden figures for free, which was even better than we'd hoped. So the second category of problems we call, it's not you, it's me. This refers to personality or other issues that you may encounter when working with people who are not part of your organization. Sometimes people are flaky. Because they don't work with you and are not accountable to your organization, they may promise things that they never then deliver on. You may have deadlines for getting programs approved or sending out advertising information, which the partner may not understand. Make your deadlines clearly understood and put them in writing. And also ask them what their deadlines they might have. When I proposed using self-portraits from local students to the art teachers from the schools, they all had different deadlines for the materials they would need because of the way they had to work the portraits into their curriculum. Then it's on me to not be the flaky one and to get the different teachers the materials they need in a timely manner. So it probably goes without saying, but definitely stay on your partners. Follow up. Have as much in writing as possible. And if commitments are made verbally, follow up with an email so that you and your partner have a clear understanding of what you have discussed or agreed upon. In the middle of tossing ideas around and feeling each other out, it's really easy to think that everyone has a clear understanding of what's supposed to happen when it isn't as clear as you think it is. 
When you send out that email, ask if you've stated everything as they understood it and ask for corrections if you haven't. It's always better to dot the I's and cross the T's than to get angry and upset because of a miscommunication. And sometimes people are just demanding. As we've mentioned, we're a public library and we don't have unlimited resources or personnel. Sometimes potential partners don't understand why we can't do things, but we have rules and policies that are designed so that we're accountable to the public and the taxpayers. And these aren't really things that we can waver on. For instance, we have a community partner who is rather demanding, albeit in a nice, polite way. She has some wonderful program ideas, in, but she's not the most timely partner and constantly has to be reminded about what she has promised to do and when she has promised to do it by. But as I said, she brings in high interest programs from a well-respected entity with a built-in audience from a specific population. Because our association with her has given us access to other opportunities, we figure it's worth it to keep this relationship going. Never fear, we have some tips on how to overcome some of the problems that we've encountered. First, be flexible. Be open to input and suggestions from the partner. They may have ideas or capabilities that you didn't know about that can actually improve your proposal or may send you in a different direction altogether. Have a positive attitude. Try to have an attitude of how we can make this work versus why their ideas won't work. A partnership is just that, multiple groups contributing to the same effort. So if you just try to impose your idea on the partner, it wouldn't really be a partnership. Communicate, communicate, communicate. The more you communicate with the potential partner, the less likely it is there will be surprises down the road. And realize that some people communicate better using different mediums. Some people will never return an email, but can be quickly reached with a phone call or text. Ask them what works best for them and always try to communicate with them in that medium. Even if it's just something as simple as, hey, I wanted to touch base and let you know that we're still waiting for approval, definitely stay in contact with them. And don't be afraid to pull the plug. Sometimes things may not work out and that's okay. Maybe the potential partner has a different idea of what they wanna get out of the partnership and that doesn't align with what you had in mind and you're not comfortable with where it's headed. We had a situation with the school and some flex learning day activities that just weren't going well and had to be scrapped. It's okay to say, maybe we need to shelve this idea for now. The timing, whatever, doesn't work out for now. Thank them for their interest and say you'll double back when the timing or proposal is better. And finally, don't burn a bridge. Believe me, there have been times when I've wanted to say, why did I even approach this person in the first place? Um, they may be difficult to work with or they don't get it or whatever. Try to extricate yourself as politely as possible. The potential partner may know someone who knows someone, and if you and you definitely want to have the reputation of being someone who is positive and easy to work with. So now we're just going to do a quick walkthrough of how we're hoping to build a community partnership this summer with vendors from the Ashland Farmers Market involving our summer reading theme, which is all together now. Remember, our goal is to make the library visibly relevant in our community by combining programming and outreach. One of our ideas for bringing people together in the library around the theme All Together Now is to host events called All Together in the Kitchen with a partner from the local farmer's market. So now that we've decided that we'd like to partner with the farmer's market, it's time to do our homework. We check out their website to see what we can learn about them. One of the first things we note is that they fall under Ashland Parks and Rec. We already have a great relationship with them, so that may give us a valuable in. We also find the contact information for the market manager. We know that they have access to farmers, they have advertising, and they have display tables. They were happy to let one of our associates set up a table last summer to sign people up for summer reading, so we know that they have display spaces. What do we have to offer them? We have a great meeting space portable cooking kits, and access to people who are looking for things to do in the summer. 
So this is our proposal. We would like to set up a table at the farmer's market once a month in May, June, and July, where we can sign people up for summer reading and library cards. We'd also like to bring cookbooks and books about organic gardening and farming from our collection for a display and have them available for checkout, which we can do easily with a laptop and a mobile hotspot. We would like the farmer's market to direct us to farmers or vendors who set up at the market and give us an in with them so that we can ask them to do a program once a month over the summer for a total of three programs. It could be a cooking program featuring locally grown fruit or vegetables, a program about organic gardening, or a program about local honey, whatever their particular specialty is. Both the library and the farmer's market would advertise. They could put it on their website, Facebook, or Instagram page, and we would use our traditional methods of advertising, flyers in the library, the town's website, our library website, and the local newspaper. Since we have her name and contact information from the website, our plan is to email the market manager, briefly explain what we're thinking, and ask for a phone call or face-to-face -face meeting. Then we can get more information and see how the plan needs to change. So this is just the beginning of our draft idea. And we know that after we speak to the market manager, some of the farmers and the vendors will be able to incorporate their ideas and really bump this all together in the kitchen idea up to the next level. Community partnerships can be as easy as falling off a log or they can be really hard and stressful. Much of how they turn out is up to you and your attitude towards them. Our best advice is to be open to possibilities, be flexible, and don't be afraid to say yes or no. Partnerships don't have to be grand to be fabulous. They just have to work for you and your community. Then everyone wins. Thank you all so much for choosing to attend this webinar. We are very excited and passionate about all the things that we've been able to do with our community partners and are thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to share that with all of you. We hope that you have heard something in this last hour that will inspire you or help you to think about all the wonderful things that are going on in your own communities and how you can take advantage of them to improve the visibility of your library in your community. Please feel free to reach out to either one of us if you have questions or thoughts or any information to share after the webinar ends. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again, and we hope you have a great rest of your conference. Thank you, Anli and Joanne, for being here today. And thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to the speaker or the conference host using the Hula app. An evaluation is provided with the conference session resources, and we welcome your feedback about the session and the conference. Thanks everyone for making the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Conference successful. See you all next year.